So, like I said, I don't have like a cute Easter message, but I am going to use some Easter Sunday scripture. Is that okay? So, those of you who are really living for Jesus and you carry a Bible to church, you can open up to John chapter number 20. And for those of you who don't, maybe you're just getting started or you know that's old news, I'm digital now, we're going to throw it up on the screens. Or of course, if you've got a smart device, you can download the Mercy City app and all the notes will be on there for you. Here's the deal. If you fall asleep in church, that's on you. We have given you every easy on-ramp to stay awake and to prove to Jesus that you are in it with him today. I mean, Easter Sunday, right? That's the one Sunday you can't fall asleep in church. I'm like, you know what I'm talking about? I should have said that first service because my kids were like nodding off, man. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Anyway. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. Somebody say, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a good day. But have you ever been in a situation or experienced something where you were expecting one thing based on a past experience? And you experience something different yeah, come on. that you weren't quite expecting. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I happen to be a part of a family who has a planner, okay? Like when we go on vacation, it's planned out. Like we know what we're going to, there's no resting by the pool. <laughs> there is no afternoon siesta. You know what I'm saying? It is go, 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 go. It is 7 a.m., you're up eating breakfast. If you don't eat breakfast, tough, buddy, because we're not eating lunch until 12. <laughs> Forget about it. We live with a planner. I, on the other hand, am not necessarily quite as planned out in the things that I do, you know? I'm like, okay, you know, and we're not setting an alarm. It's vacation. <laughs> <laughs> How many of y'all know that the people who don't plan always give way to the people who plan? <laughs> Except in this instance, Mary showed up and she had a plan in place. She knew what she was walking into and she knew based on the experiences of her walking with Jesus for these past few years where he had been here and now present with her. He had seen her. She had seen him. She knew that she was going to show up and she was going to prepare his body to be laid to rest. But she found something contrary to what she was expecting. Therefore, she had to, in her mind, wrap her head around her experience was about to change. She ran and she found Simon Peter, and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. Now, time out for just a minute. John wrote this gospel, and I love the fact that John doesn't just say, yo, she went and she found Peter and I. He didn't say that. He was like this humble brag type of guy, you know what I'm saying? Like, he, she went and found the disciple whom Jesus loved. You know what I mean? John, just say your name, bro, right? <laughs> yo, everybody knows those people, right? Oh, yeah, this one. Come on, man. Come on, man. Give God glory by putting your name in there. I don't even know. Anyway. <laughs> she said to them, they've taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple, John, started out for the tomb, and they were both running. But the other disciple, John, <laughs> outran Peter and reached the tomb first. <laughs> this is hilarious. <laughs> anyway, he stooped down and he looked in and saw the linen wrappings were laying there, but he didn't go in. And then Peter arrived and he went inside and he also noticed that the linen wrappings were lying there while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first, John, also went in. And he saw and believed. Maybe John left his name out of here because 
while he was the disciple that Jesus loved and while he was the disciple that obviously could beat Peter in a foot race, he wasn't the disciple that had yet believed, even though he had walked with Jesus, been with Jesus. The Bible even says that he laid his head against Jesus' chest. <clears throat> he knew Jesus. They had embraced. He, he knew him. He had seen him eye to eye and face to face, yet the Bible clearly tells us here, when he saw that he wasn't there, when he saw that his expectations not only were not met, but they were exceeded, he believed. All the while he was walking with Jesus, all those Sunday mornings that he had said in church, he still, while he had experienced something, did not yet believe until... It went from the moment where Jesus was here now with him to now he was nowhere to be found. But the Bible says he believed when he saw that Jesus wasn't there. For until then, they, had, they hadn't understood the scriptures that Jesus said that he must rise from the dead. So they went home. But Mary continued standing outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she stooped and she looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where Jesus' body was lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angel asked her. Because they've taken my Lord away, she replied, and I don't know where they put him. I came here based on an experience expecting one thing, but I found another. I've known Jesus walking with him and walking with me over these past several years, and now I came based on that experience expecting something to take place, and he's nowhere to be found. I came here based on the experience of him being here and now with me physically, but now he's nowhere. Where is he? I don't know. And she turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked. Why, who are you looking for? And she thought that he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, please tell me where you've put him, and I will go there to get him. Here's what we do in life. This same thing. We came here this morning even with a set of expectations based on past experiences. And I'd be willing to bet that some of us showed up here this morning and we expected one thing, but we've experienced another thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, whoa, that isn't the way that we've always done it. That's not the way that we do it at my church. That's not the way that we, the church that you go to on Easter and Christmas. That's not the way you do it. You know what I'm saying? But here's what I'm telling you. This isn't something, it's not a game that we play or a performance that we put on once a year just so we, this is something that we do and celebrate. We celebrate the person of Jesus every single week without fail. Yeah, come on. Today's just, that just happens to be the day that we make a big to-do so that we can observe and hopefully point new people yeah. to the person of Jesus so we can push them beyond their past experiences that have shaped their expectation and help them realize that it's in the midst of the nowhere of God, the, the, the nowhere to be found. I see everybody else meeting with Jesus. I see everybody else experiencing God, but I don't experience him like that. I've had many of you tell me over the past years, I would never lift my hands. I would never dance in the front row. <laughs> That's okay, you don't have to, because up until this point, your expectation is based on your experience. But now you're beginning to see and realize there is nowhere, Jesus is nowhere to be found. What he's doing is he's calling you to himself. And while John and Peter and Mary, they felt alone and that Jesus was nowhere to be found, he was actually setting them up. He showed up to Mary. And in verse 16, it says, Mary. And, Jesus, and she turned and cried out to him, Rabbi, because as soon as she heard his voice, while he didn't look familiar to her, 
This may not look familiar, but I'm praying and believing that you'll hear the voice of God in the midst of today's service at some moment, that you might be able to recognize the person of Jesus, and he's calling your name. As you turn to him, you can say, Rabbi. But here's why it had to change. It had to change. He had to be found nowhere in the midst because he says, don't cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go and find my brothers and tell them I'm ascending to my Father and to your Father too, Mary, to my God and to your God too. Side note, I love this portion of Scripture. Everybody wants to make a big issue about women preaching. The very first preacher in the Bible that God commissioned, Jesus commissioned himself, was a woman. Isn't that crazy? Listen, here's the cool thing about the Bible. I can just preach it because I read it. I didn't write it. You know what I'm saying? So don't be mad at me. Be mad at John, the disciple that Jesus loved. (laughs) Isn't that fun? I think that's so fun. Some of y'all are angry right now. (laughs) But God, are you sure? Anyway, praise the Lord, everybody. Hey, listen, I'm sure mom's got some ham in the oven, and it's going to be great, right? You don't? Okay. (laughs) But Jesus says, don't cling to me. He said, I know you came here based on some expectation, and you thought you were going to cling to me, but you're not called to cling to me. Huh? Okay, we got to keep reading. So Mary found the disciples and told them, I've seen the Lord. Then she gave them this message. That that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there, right there among them. Peace be with you, he said. And as he spoke, he showed them his wounds and his hands and in his side. And they were filled with great joy when they saw the Lord. And he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am also sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. The reason that she showed up with, with an expectation based on experience and she did not find Jesus is because he did not want her just like he does not want you and I to cling only to him. He wants us to cling to the person and the power of the Holy Spirit because Jesus was one man, although he was God, when he walked the face of the earth, he was one man and he could only be in one place at one time. Come on. Come on. But the Spirit of God can be in all places, at all times, filling the lives of all men and all women who receive. See, what Jesus was trying to get to us is an unlimited life. What Jesus was trying to open up to us was endless possibility. What Jesus was trying to get to us is the fact that, you know what, you can do something that is spiritual in nature to affect a natural world that I'm calling you to live in. Hmm. Wouldn't it be so much easier if it was just like natural, like we could just, hey, Jesus, and just shake his hand? (laughs) Like, wouldn't that be so, like, come on, man, wouldn't it, wouldn't it? Some of us would say yes. But man, I'm telling you, there's nothing like living, knowing that Jesus left for a purpose. And the purpose that Jesus left was for you and for me to live our best life. So based on our experiences, we show up with expectations and Jesus says, I know, that's, I, and I know you've got expectations based on what has happened in your past. But I'm not going to be there anymore. Because I want you to find out where I am for your future. Good, Pastor Matt. Because Jesus was here now with us physically. One person, one time, one place. Then he was nowhere to be found. But now, and no surprise should it be to the disciples or to those of us who have ever read the scriptures, it should be no surprise. He's now here 
on the inside of us. Right. Remember the Bible says that he, and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Some of us are like, whoa, that's weird. This is surprising. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. And here's why. Here's why. Because in the Bible, I'm reading out of John 20, right? Let's back up to John chapter 14. Okay? I'm, and I'm going to read it out of the Bible Bible, like the, the, the word of the Lord, everybody, because I want you to see this. Jesus wasn't surprising, and he wasn't trying to trick anybody. He had already set the disciples up for this, and he already set us up for it, too. Check it out. Check it out. Check it out. And there's a reason for it. Okay, this is John, the disciple who Jesus loved, (laughs) who beat Peter in the foot race. Okay? Chapter 14, verse number 12. Let's start reading here, verse number 12. He says this, Jesus, speaking to his disciples, says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done, and even greater works. Cool. You and I, who believe in him, will do the same and even greater works. That's pretty cool, isn't it? That's why we gather to celebrate Easter. We don't just do it so we can dye Easter eggs and and hunt a bunny down. Wait, you hunt the eggs, not the bunny, right? Okay. (laughs) (laughs) This is why we do this. He says, you'll do greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. So time out for a minute, time out. So you and I are going to do greater works by the Spirit of God. Why? Because he's going to be with his Father? So Jesus isn't even going to be around, but you and I have the ability to do greater things. We got to keep reading. I got to keep, I got to keep reading. Because it seems like I'd do better things if Jesus was in the room with me, right? So let's, let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. Verse 13. You can ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. That's why when we pray, we pray in the name of Jesus. That's where the power is. So that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Okay, okay, cool. Jesus bring, makes sense. Yes, ask me anything in my name and I will do it. Verse 15 go on to, goes on to say, if you love me, obey my commands, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate. So someone in addition to me, he's saying, another advocate. I'm for you, I'm with you, I'm about you, but there's another one who's coming that will be able to take you into even greater works. Woo, okay, cool, here we go. Who is this guy? Someone who will never leave you or forsake you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth. Come on. Right there in the Bible. What? Holy cow, man. So you mean it wasn't just the fact that Jesus had some good Listerine and was like, received the whole. No, it wasn't about that at all. It was a pre-thought, it was a pre-planned situation. He knew this was going to take place because he knew that you and he knew that me, we would need more than just a story from a book. He knew that we would need to be filled with a certain power of a certain person who was connected to a certain father in heaven and a son who walked the earth that brought a certain power that would cause us to live in a way that does even greater works. I know, I know, I know. All of us in Nebraska, we're just, we're just A-OK with living the good life. And there's nothing wrong with the good life. But I wonder what would happen if we would step beyond the good life and start living the life that God intended for us to live. I wonder if what would happen if we began to operate according to the power of God's Spirit. And it was awakened on the inside of us, and we began to carry that into places that needed affected. Yeah, that's good. Can, I, know, I know we've got lots of visitors here today. We've got visitors online, and we just, and so I know that I'm not everybody's pastor today, but if I am your pastor, listen to my voice. And if I'm not, I wonder if you'd still listen to my voice and just allow me for, you know, 38 seconds to put my pastor cap on and encourage you in the most pastoral way I know how and say this to you. Please stop taking God's name in vain.
most all of our minds went to this place. I, I can't tell you the last time I've used that expletive. That's not what it's about. See, we've reduced taking the name of the Lord in vain to a certain expletive. But that's not even what it's about. Don't do that because it just sounds bad. You know what I mean? Like, come on, man. We're all more intelligent than having to use, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> Some of y'all are like, you ain't my pastor. <laughs> you can't tell me what. Okay, it's fine, it's fine. But here's what I believe that really taking the Lord's name in vain is. When God says, Jesus says that you'll do greater works than even I have done. You'll become more in Christ than you are without. But you reduce it down to, oh, it's just me, just uh, it's ho-hum, a-okay, just living a good life, and you live in a way that is less than God's very best for you. When you don't go after everything in obedience that God has called you to, and you reduce it down to, well, I don't want to be cocky or I don't want to be arrogant. What about being confident in who Jesus is? What about being confident in who Christ has called you to be? That is not taking the Lord's name in vain, becoming all that you're called to be. Well, I don't want somebody else to feel bad. Well, let them feel bad about being disobedient. That's okay. Don't you do it too? That was longer than 38 seconds. <laughs> but God did this for a reason. Not so that you can think less of yourself, but so that you can become more. Because like I said earlier, some of you have said, I'll never be that person. But then you caught a glimpse of somebody else becoming more. And now, when I met you four years ago or six years ago or two years ago, you have stepped into something different. Some of you I met six months ago, and you've stepped into another dimension of life, and you've become more because you caught a glimpse of somebody else, and their faith inspired you. I wonder how your faith could inspire somebody else if you would stop making apologies and just live according to the life that God's called you to. That's why we celebrate and we observe this holiday. Yeah. It's not just so that we can get together with family. It's so that we can become more by the power of the Spirit. The book of Romans says it's the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is the Spirit that now dwells in you. It's the same Spirit that Jesus said, receive the Spirit. But why? Why? I think this is why. I was reading the scriptures a, a month ago or so, and, and this stood out to me, and I had never seen it like this before. It's in the book of John again, the disciple who Jesus loves, you know, the, the whole foot race guy, that guy. Verse 21, or chapter 21, verse 25. You got to understand that this is the last verse of the last chapter of what many don't know, but this is the last gospel that was added to the canon of Scripture. Because as early, as early theologians were kind of debating and praying through and seeking God about what, what, uh, what gospels would be put in, they, they were for sure with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But they were undecided on John, and here's why. Because Matthew, Mark, and Luke address Jesus in his humanity, and everybody could relate to Jesus in his humanity. But John addressed Jesus in his deity as God. It was so spiritual, some people considered it scandalous. Like, that's, that's out there, man. But it's also why whenever people receive Jesus, the first thing I tell them to, to read is the book of John. Like, let's figure out who Jesus is as God and work the rest out. You know what I'm saying? We need the power of God in our lives. We don't need the power of another human in our lives. We need to recognize Jesus for who he is, God, yeah. in the flesh. And so this is what John wrote in, in the 21st chapter, 25th verse. He says this, Jesus also did many other things. If it were all written down, I suppose the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. So John in chapter 14 talks about how we will do greater works based on the power of the Holy Spirit that is given to us through Jesus. Then in John chapter 20, when he does the foot race and he beats Peter and he sees 
nothing, nowhere, and begins to believe, he realizes, oh, chapter 14, connected with chapter 20, and now with chapter 21. I don't think John is writing about past things that Jesus did. I think Jesus probably did some stuff that wasn't written down in the Scripture for the book, right? But here's what I believe more than anything. What John is doing is he's seeing into a place where there's nothing. A future generation where he saw Spencer, and he saw Jessica, and he saw Seth, and he saw Dory. I believe that he was peering into the por- through the portals of time, and he saw into the future, and he began to speak prophetically according to God's Word, and saying, you know what, according to the Spirit, Jesus said that we will do greater works. And because the Spirit of God indwells us as humans, guess what? Our lives now become books. I don't know if I'll ever put the book of Tyler in the Bible. I'm not sure I'll put the book of Aubrey in the Bible. And I'm not necessarily sure that it should be placed in the Bible. But here's what the Apostle Paul says. Can I read you this? This is so fun. This is so fun. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. And some of you are like, I don't know about this. Listen to the Scripture. It says this. The only, recommend, the only letter of recommendation that we need is you yourselves. What's he saying? He's saying, I agree with John. I don't think that everything that Jesus has done could be contained in one book. Because I believe that Jesus is now alive on the inside of you. Yeah. And because Jesus is now alive on the inside of you, Henry, and, 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 and because Jesus is now alive on the inside of you, Adam, because Jesus is now alive on the inside of you, Morgan, because Jesus is now alive on the inside of you, one book can't contain it. It's going to be many books. It's going to be many letters. It's going to be many things. But are you going to allow God to use your life to write a new story? Because the only letter of recommendation that people need to read or see is you. Your lives are letters written on your hearts. Everyone can read it and recognize the good work that God's done among you. Clearly you are a letter from Christ showing the results of ministry among you. This letter is not written with pen and ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. It's carved not on tablets of stone, but it's written on human hearts. There is a letter written on the tablet of your heart. And God wants to use your story to impact somebody else. That's why we celebrate Easter. That's why we're here today. It's not so we can go through religious motions. It's so that Monday morning, April 5th, matters in my world too. We wake up and celebrate Easter, but then we go back to the same thing tomorrow. I wonder what new story God wants to write on the tablet of your heart. I love this last night. my family and I, we invited some people over, and, and we had a bonfire. And, um, and Lila Jane, our youngest, she's 11, and, you know, um, just youngest child. Um, we've got this slope in her backyard going next to our house, and, and uh, she thought it would be fun to, to ride down this thing. Well, it was a bad idea because, you know, when all the snow melts it off, like the runoff caused some ruts in the yard and, you know, dad hasn't gotten around to fixing it yet, you know what I'm saying? And so she successfully did pass number one and her bike was rattling like, you know, like, you know what I'm saying? Have you ever, have you ever ridden a bike on some, just like some unstable terrain, you know, like, y'all know what I'm talking about? She got down at the bottom of the hill and her eyes were this big and she's like, that was awesome. And everybody was like, whoa, that was crazy. Don't do that again. And she's like, I'm doing it again. I'm doing it again. I said, Lila Jane, that's a bad idea. Don't do it again. Don't do it again. 
It wasn't five minutes later, I'm putting some more wood on the fire, and the people that we're with, they're, my back's to Lila Jane, and, and, and their face is toward her, and their eyes are this big. And she's coming down, and she happened to hit one of the stone steps in the walkway, and she turned her bike over and ended up, and ended up on, the, on, on the pavement, and then she hit up against the chain link fence, and then her face is like <laughs> on the ground. You know what I'm saying? And I just looked over at her. And I thought, man, I told you not to do that. You know what I'm saying? Of course, her brothers and sisters are roaring, laughing. They thought it was the funniest thing ever. You, you don't want to be the youngest in any family, right? So she gets up and she brushes herself up and she's not crying, but she goes directly to the house, in the house around the other way, not around anybody. She was embarrassed. She got a drink of water and she came outside and she sat on one of the stumps and we were enjoying the fire. Literally, within minutes she came out. Everybody's still laughing. That's how soon she comes out. And every Friday, they get, a, they get a, an assignment to do some creative writing. And she sat there on the stump and she said, well, I know what I'm writing about this weekend. <laughs> and isn't that the attitude that you think your father wants to take with your life? The thing that you felt like the enemy wanted to use to take you out or that disqualified you or made you think that your story doesn't matter or that God can't do anything with you. That's the thing I believe that God wants to use to write on the tablets of your heart to bring life where you thought there was death so that God could breathe his spirit yeah. into you. Why? So somebody else can experience what you've experienced. So somebody else can learn from what you thought was meant to take you out. God's not done with you. In fact, he's breathed his spirit on the inside of you. Your story's not over. God wants to use your life, your story, to fill the many books of the works of Jesus. Today, he wants to start. Come on, I know you were coming in expecting one thing based on your past experience. But that's not how we roll. Jesus is saying, come, come closer, come closer. There's a spirit that I've filled you with. Yeah. And I've been riding since the beginning of time on the tablet of your heart. Yeah. Come on, would you stand on your feet today? And as you stand on your feet, I wonder if you would think, God, I thank you that you're not done with me yet. I'm, I'm thankful that you have not given up on me. I'm thankful that you save marriages. I'm thankful that you restore marriages. I, I thank you that you restore lives who are destroyed over broken marriages. I thank you for delivering people from addiction. But God, I also thank you for healing those who were the victims or suffered the fallout of addiction. Listen to me, no matter where you are, you can find something to be thankful for. And the Spirit of God is available to you, written on the tablet of your heart. Here now, nowhere to be found, now here on the inside of us. Come on, I wonder if you're comfortable, would you lift your hands? You say, that's me, God. I want to experience you here now. I've always thought of you one way, but today I'm seeing another thing. I came looking for one thing, but I didn't see it. I saw something else. Father, I see all the hands outstretched, all the hearts open wide. And I know most importantly, you do too. And so God, I pray that on this Easter Sunday, it would be a turning point. It would be a moment where movement takes place, where people move forward by the power of your presence in the person of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.